Okay, good morning everybody. Uh, this webinar series of the Cordillera Textile Project or the Corditex at the UP Baguio. So today we are pleased to have with us uh, from Romania. Uh, it's five o'clock. I know it's five o'clock in the morning there, but uh, she accommodated our request now for uh, this time for the webinar in in Baguio, in Manila, for Manila time. So we'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Florica Zaharia. She is conservator emerita of the Metropolitan Museum of Art and the director and co-owner of the Museo Textilor Textilor in uh, Romania. So for 28 years, uh, Florica was a member of the Department of Textile Conservation at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, New York and 13 years as conservator in charge of the department, working with a group of world-renowned textile conservators. After her retirement from the Met in 2016, uh, she returned to her native country in Romania and opened the Museo Textilor in Baita, if I uh, pronounce it cor correctly, at the Hunedora County in Romania. Uh, this is a private textile museum with a collection of approximately 12,000 pieces no, collected in Romania and worldwide by her and her family during the last five decades. So Dr. Zaharia has researched, published, lectured, curated exhibitions, and taught on the subjects of textile conservation and preservation, textile materials and technology, and Eastern European textiles. Besides her PhD thesis, uh, she has published in various journals and books and has curated several exhibitions on her work. Among these are Textile Traditional, Dean Transylvania Technology in Aesthetica, no? traditional textiles from Transylvania, Technologies and Aesthetics, The Secret Life of Textiles, Plant Fibers, and The Secret Life of Textiles or Animal Fibers, and many more. Dr. Zaharia has an MA with a specialization in tapestry and textile structure and designs and a PhD in visual arts with a focus on textile materials and technologies and their impact on the artifacts aesthetic qualities. She earned her academic degrees from the National University of Art, Nicolae Gregoreska in Bucharest, Romania. So without further ado, we'd like to welcome Dr. Zaharia. Dr. Florica. I'm here, but I think my video is has been stopped by you. Okay. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Rose, is it working? Well, okay. All right. Good morning Thank to you. everyone. And good morning. Yeah. And good morning to Yonalyn. Thank you for um uh, your introduction and and thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, to to speak to you a little bit about uh, my belief related to textile to your group. So, um, I I I have to I have to thank somebody else for introducing us to each other besides Nina Tesoro, my dear friend, the Patis Tesoro, Nina's mother, uh, the well well-known artist, world-renowned artist that I'm sure you all know and you should be proud of her. Uh, Patisse invited me and my husband last year to to, and to introduce us to, um, to your culture, to your textile culture and much more. So we're so grateful. That was the time Annalina and, and I, we met and um, and also so, so much about your, your uh, textile heritage. So Fantastic. Um, thank you for that. Thank you all. And I'm looking forward to seeing you again these times and your, your invitees also seeing you in Baitsa at the Museo Textile Lord. Why not? <laughs> all right. Um, so let me let me start my uh, my talk. Uh, tell you what I think about uh, textile preservation, but uh, give me a moment to share my screen. Okay, uh, tap, tap, tap. Here I am, okay. Can you see everything is okay? Right? Can you hear me? 
Yes. Uh, there's no uh, PowerPoint yes, yet. Oh, no, we there, can hear you. There is no. Where did that go? Hmm. Okay. Give me a second. I will be right there. I hope. All right. Share screen again. Um. Mm -hmm. Why this is not happening? You can oh. share your screen at the. That's why I'm. There you go. Doing... Okay. Um, you can see it now. You can see it now. Oh, excuse me, excuse me. I'm... Um, just a moment. I will be there. All right. Um. Okay, so it's everything all right now? Yeah? Yes. Can you hear me okay? Yes, all right. I can hear you now. So I'm starting with uh, showing you where I'm coming from. So I'm coming from two places besides my, my um, place of birth and where we live right now. It's where our museum is in Baitza and in that region. And here you see, I'm not going to go much into what we're doing in a museum textile a lot, but um, uh, I invite you all to see the our website or just uh, Google our name uh, and you will find more. more. Many of, of information will be uh, in Romanian, but also we have a English uh, version for for our basic information so we are basically having three buildings we're functioning now in two the one on the upper image needs uh, restoration and this is huge project but anyway we are showing uh, and we are we're researching and sharing with the public and uh, working with the uh, a uh, Romanian collection in a in a dialogue with the worldwide textile collection. So this is one place that, as Annalina was saying, um, we started with my family after 2016, when we returned to Romania and left from this amazing institution, which is the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And here you you see it in a in a Central Park image down there. Um, it's an amazing institution. If you didn't have a chance to visit it yet, I encourage you to do so. It's much to talk about it, but uh, we will leave this for another talk. So um, let's, I, I'm bringing here two, two pieces and I like dialogue. I like cultural dialogue always. And um, these times I'm bringing the Romanian and the, and the Filipino, uh, textile heritage. So I'm sure you're you're recognizing your beautiful uh, piece on the right, uh, which is made of piña, of course, and the cotton cotton applique. Uh, and, and on the left we have a Romanian blouse from Muschel region. They are both um, part of the uh, Metropolitan Museum uh, of Art donation uh, to our museums. Uh, so. Why am I bringing the, those two pieces? What is the what is the the, the preservation of our textile heritage? Um, we're talking about objects, right? And the first visual impact it's a, it's a be they're beautiful object. They are interesting. They give us some information. But as the professionals, we're going much deeper than that. So immediately, to my mind, it comes to the materials. It comes the place where they're coming from. Um, in this case, they're opposite. They are, they are so distant. What a distant culture. And still, um, we are both from traditional cultures. So we bring some, some, we have some similarities, but our environment is really putting us way apart. So, um, when we talk about preserving the, the, the heritage, we have to think about the environment where they come from, uh, those objects. We have to think what they were made from. We have to preserve the technology um, that transforms a specific material to, these, to those objects. And then after that, we talk after understanding the object, you're going further and thinking about what do we need 
for enable to to in order to enable us to preserve those those uh, information uh, to preserve those physical objects uh, for posterity and for sharing it with uh, with professionals with public and with people who who are interested and how do we do this so i'm trying to briefly cover all those issues in this uh, in this uh, discussion we're having today and hopefully we'll be inspired, but hopefully we will uh, generate some questions from you. So um, I'm just going in further into this uh, dialogue, cultural dialogue. And uh, I just want to uh, share with you a little bit of my experience with fibers um, working for many, many decades now in Romania, but also bringing the, the experience I have in the Philippines. And just to, I'm, sh I'm sure you know all this already, uh, I'm bringing in discussion the piña because this was the object we were, we were showing. Um, but but just to uh, evidence the the uh, difference in technology and and as a result the object and and again throughout this process we have to understand it we have to know it otherwise it's it's the preservation will be extremely difficult so here is the hemp on the left side. Um, uh, I'm not going to go into too many details um, again, but we are seeing two levels of hemp. One is a, almost a human level or could be a little bit higher and one which are over, over three meters high. And those produce different kind of fibers. And um, there could be separation by three or four categories. And from there we go further and separate the, the quality of fibers by the, by the quality of, of fabric we need to, to produce for specific objects. And yet, if we go in your culture, here is um, your piña. And uh, um, if we go a little bit further, um, I'm just covering a little bit the process for hemp and I'm coming back to piña. Uh, I'm talking about these different qualities of fibers, depending on how thin or how thick the, the uh, plants are, and you do the retting to dissolve the pectin that holds the fibers together to the plants, you're drying it, you are crushing the dry um, um, part, the wooden part of the, um, of the hemp, and then you're combing it uh yet you're spinning it so the spun this is a point you're we're spinning it your piña it's not spun as you well know and this is one part of the secret why you produce a different material so our our um thread even before weaving, we try to make it softer and whiter as possible. We try to um, make it the dense as possible the fabric uh, because we're we're living in a in a cold climate. It's a temperate climate. We are furthermore we're in a mountain, and the winter are are harsh. So you need to have a warmer material that is closer to your body. So here we have example of bleaching of whitening, um, and um, again, who's interested? I can share um, if you write to me or I can share publish information about this. Uh, you're seeing difference in bleaching, you're seeing the woven fabric, and then after you weaving it, you're bleaching it again, just keeping it wet on the grass. Um, in the other hand, you know all about your piña fiber, which is extraordinary. And I'm not gonna explain it because I'm sure you can explain it better than me. Uh, first, to, Quali I mean, second quality, the bastos uh, fibers that you extract first, and then uh, you extract the best quality, the linion. And here is Gina Reporenko and the uh, Reichel Pina Clause um, in Al Aklan that um, uh, Patisse and her team um, facilitated us to to visit, so we are very grateful for that. But you're you're producing this this 
incredible fibers, very fine. You're then nutting it and uh, you're having the results. So here is our hemp spun with a thick thread, many fibers together. We can even ply it if we need. And here is your delicate pina knotted and producing a, a fabric almost like a paper because there is no twist in the fibers. Now, this is, again, I'm pointing it out, um, these details, because those are essential components of the preservation. And uh, this is just an example, but every single material, if we talk about cotton, if we talk about uh, protein fibers, they are all having their own characteristic. And uh, if we don't, under, as far as I'm concerned, if we don't understand that, and if we don't start with this, which means many time uh, field work, and you are so fortunate to have plenty of opportunity um, in Philippines. And, and again, um, it's because some people like uh, Patisse Tesoro, Senator Lagarde, and you guys up there, you're really doing a great job. So this is a fabric um, on the left. It's a, it's a hemp fabric and we have about six warps and six width per centimeters. And this is 10 times um, much higher concentration of pure piña fabric, one of the best and finest possible fabric made around this world. And uh, for both in each culture, it's a tedious work. Um, aesthetically, they are fantastic. Um, um, with a historic importance and so far, but I encourage the researcher and the people who work in the preservation to go deeper in understanding the materials uh, because we cannot do the wrong things and destroy those knotted, the knotted fibers or, or uh, uh, hem fabric is a little bit sturdier, but nevertheless, so we need a collection, right, to work with, or we need to work with somebody's collection. And forgive me, Patis, for not uh, taking, uh, having your permission to show your uh, this picture, but um, I hope it's okay. Uh, Patis um, not only shared with us uh, incredible um, knowledge about uh, your your textile and fibers, but she also donated to our museum. Uh, very important uh, materials for us uh, that and that fill many gaps in our in our collection from your part of the world, and uh, those are part of it. So thank you, Patis. Now let's talk about what we need for um, for starting a preservation. Before having the knowledge, I mean, besides having the knowledge, besides having the people, of course, trained that need a special training to perform this work, um, we need the facilities. So I'm not going to bring. Uh, I'm going to bring the the, the um, information um, and share with you some information related to what's happening at the Metropolitan because uh, Museum of Art in the Department of Textile Conservation specifically. Why? Because uh, they are, uh, as far as I know, one of the best, if not the best, facilities in the world with um, a group, exceptional professional group working on this uh, um, uh, activity on conserving and preserving textiles. So um, it, it's not that it has to be everything at this level. I mean, uh, things could be done and uh, in a much simpler way and um, in another uh, in another talk or when I even you, when I was in um, in uh, Philippines, I did share with uh, some of you who were coming to my talk, thank you for that, 
Uh, I share a little bit of what's happening in our young museum uh, in Baitsa, which we um, started in 2017, and uh, we still uh, have a lot of work to do. So um, from experience, I'm telling you that um, it, it doesn't have to be everything at the highest level uh, in terms of complexity, but in terms of work, you can be at that high level if you know what you're doing. And and little by little get where you where you want to have more sophisticated um, uh, facilities. So what's happening here? The space is never big enough, but it's about uh, nine thousand square feet. Uh, the whole lab, we have the main area, uh, of course, the library, and uh, we have the labs, specific labs, solvent lab, where uh, we try to stay away from working with solvents, but nevertheless, you can never be totally out of, of this. We have a testing lab, chemical, chemistry lab, dye lab, wet lab, where we can wash textile and so on. So let's go a little bit um, over. And the conservators offices and so on uh, but I'm going to bring you briefly through through the facilities so to get a little bit more sense of what's going on uh, two images um, one on the left um, the image is from 1989 when actually I after I started working on the at the math in 88 uh, so you know, it was very simple. It was a very unsophisticated um, uh, lab environment. Nevertheless, what people did that, uh, it was um, a little bit further from the beginning of the profession because textile conservation, textile preservation, although it has been done always in a, in an old fashioned way, but as a profession and uh, it, um, it's um, not that, uh, doesn't, didn't start it so long ago. In fact, this department, Department of Textile Conservation at the Metropolitan, this year is celebrating 50 years, uh, just 50 years from, from its formation. Uh, so, um, so much has been done. Um, on the left, you have the main lab uh, image with um, um, conservators working in various projects. And uh, here is a little bit a closer, uh, closer view. And uh, of course, it's a it's a larger it's a larger uh, uh, space from the old from old lab. Um, so you can see we have separate tables. So we have a, and this is important for a lab. Um, we have a various dimension of table that could be ensembled and disassembled um, for accommodating the various sizes of objects. And um, this is this is good because in a collection like, and depends. You have to you have to um, adjust that to your needs. Uh, you know your collection, so um, uh, think about that when you start a lab. But um, the mat, you know, you see here the emperor carpet, which is an enormous, in the front, an enormous uh, 16th century Persian carpet. You see uh, tapestries, European tapestry, but you also see a small fragments uh, of various uh, culture. Um, we're covering worldwide uh, um, objects in that lab, and conservators are specialized in the particular area. Nevertheless, they have to work together and have they have to help each other because uh, you might be able to work in a little fragment uh, by yourself, but when you need to work with a large piece, you have to bring the whole lab in this activity. So um, then you have to be uh, flexible. Uh, what is challenging, and this is also something to think about, is challenging to to work sometimes elbow to elbow in a totally different project. And you have to concentrate and you have to correlate information. You have to do analytical work. Um, all that, it's not, uh, uh, it's not easy, it's a challenge. Um, to say is that, um, in, in the United States and in the Met in particular, um, it is a little bit of 
different approach or different responsibilities of a conservator uh, compared with European, uh, for example. And with Asian, I'm sure you have your also uh, some differences. But in Europe, many places, the conservator means something else. Um, conserving the object and the restoration is the one who has the hands-on object. In at the Met, conservators means you're 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 doing analytical work, you are doing investigation, you're going on a on a field trip and and try to understand all those material that we previously talked about. Um, you're coming in the lab with samples or or with knowledge, and you use the analytical equipment um, to help you understand the materials and and the object that you have in the front of you or the culture you're studying and so on. After you understand all that, you have to understand the condition of the object, and then you propose the treatment. You perform the treatment. Uh, and then you're preparing the objects for the storage or you're preparing it for the exhibition, you're traveling with objects for the loans and so on. So it's a whole pack. You publish, you share your your knowledge with, with uh, colleagues and with the public. So it's a really, really complex profession. And I must say, I like it this way. Um, of course, the curators are different groups uh, and they are looking more into the history of the of the object, they're looking less in the technical uh, aspect of the object. And then here is where the conservators are coming and putting together all this knowledge. So in other words, you need all these groups to complete each other, to, to work with each other in an institution where we are talking about preservation. Um, and, and all that has to be an harmonious and uh, uh, complementary work. So, um, uh, yeah, I know um, I'm talking a little bit in the I I idealistic situation because some institution cannot afford to have all, all this, but I always think, let's start with the higher. And then if you know where you want to be, then eventually you will get in there somehow. So I was talking about analytical work. Um, of course, first of all, you have to, I, I have to always to understand the materials and uh, we're going to that, to the testing lab a little bit further, but I just, I'm in a main area and uh, just want to point out this equipment we have, which is great. Um, it's actually, everything was built to our specification. You cannot just go in the market and buy this bridge with the equipment. They're made of various pieces. And again, built um, with specialists to accommodate our needs. And our need was to move this bridge with the equipment on the top of this big table where a, a large object could be analyzed uh, without touching it. And with a remote control from the distance, you can capture images where you can look at the object at various man magnification and you can see the uh, texture and you can see the structure. Uh, we know the, the besides the, the uh, fibers and dyes and finishing the structure, the textile structure, are extremely important. And I have seen some very beautiful uh, um, publication and exhibitions in your country um, that show me that you, you know what I'm talking about. And um, um, you, have, uh, you have some wonderful textiles and you do have some uh, um, not not very complex structure, but still a very interesting structures. And besides the plain weave, uh, that fun, that fantastic pina, uh, it's starting with. So I was talking about the testing lab. Um, of course, uh, we have. I'm going a little bit. Uh, I will go back. Uh, we are talking about reference materials. When you go into uh, uh, in talking to the people who still produce uh, textile materials, 
samples um, and uh, comprehensive step-by-step uh, -step produce uh, uh, collected uh, samples from various steps of the technological process are crucial. And building a, a reference collection is very important for understanding the object for the preservation work um, altogether. So those are just some example. This is uh, this Romanian hemp, um, uh, and it's just a little fragment of it. We have much more samples of this and uh, uh, samples of uh, natural dyes. Uh, we we have various looms and it's always good to have them around to uh, practice various uh, woven structure and especially for the students and the youngers, but also for the um, professionals. Sometimes you have figured it out something and the loom can help you tremendously. Um, so I'm going back to the testing lab. Um, you know, I'm not going to go into details about the equipment. Uh, from experience, again, I know that you can spend tens of thousands and go uh, very high in prices and buy the most sophisticated materials, uh, um, e analytical equipment, I mean, and, um, um, you know, there are issues into fiber identifications and uh, you can help you a little bit with the equipment. Nevertheless, you can do with very little. If you have uh, equipment with, with the 400 magnification, most likely it will be sufficient to see uh, the morphology, longitudinal for mor for, uh, morphology that we have here, the hemp, for example, or cross-sectional morphology, which is really, really important, especially for the uh, bust fibers, and not only. Um, I'm just bringing here an image of the microton. This is a, a tool that uh, I like to use for the cross-sectional um, um, morphology of fibers. And um, uh, we actually, um, I learned this at the Met. We use, uh, there are other methods, but uh, this is this is my favorite. And um, uh, if anybody has a question on this, uh, we can talk until next week about fibers, but we can, we can, uh, we can, I can have some, some, uh, we can go more further into this discussion, but for now, let's keep going. Color, dyes are very, very important in the process of understanding the object, in the process of conservation and preservation. In fact, are crucial uh, because um, and properly, properly uh, store, properly handle, properly display uh, object could save the object, but improperly you can lose it. Uh, color will be the first that goes, probably. Fiber will go too. Don't think that if you keep it in the uh, white undyed materials on the light, uh, it will be okay. No, the light and the environment has uh, um, affect the condition of the fiber as well. But you will see it, it's accumulation. You will see it um, less drastically, less rapidly. Dyes, you will see disappearing very fast and depends what type of, what kind of dye. Some are more sensitive than others. Definitely natural dyes are very sensitive. Uh, here we just, uh, I'm just showing you what's happening in the dye lab. Um, uh, we're seeing this uh, Ahiba machine that we use to dye our own yarn for the restoration uh, of certain, certain pieces, um, uh, for example, the reweaving of tapestries or, for example, support fabric for, uh, for a fragmentary piece and so on. Um, in, with a Hiba uh, machine, we always use um, uh, synthetic uh, dyes, mostly Sibagagi. Probably you know it. Um, and after that, we, of course, we perform uh, light testing and um, 
correlate that with our museum environment and the hours in which we expect to display the, the object. So um, in most cases, we can, those materials that we dye are safe for the next 400 years. Um, so, but not only this is what's happening in our dye lab, we like to exercise and to understand the natural dyes. Because again, uh, if you don't have that experience um, of how the natural dyes are different from the, from the synthetic dyes, and there are a lot of differences there, um, then you will have a trouble in, in understanding your object and, and preserving it. Um, so we just have a sample here of um, uh, Brazil wood actually with uh, alumordant and without mordant. And furthermore, we have example of some um, uh, synthetic reds, which we dyed to match the natural dye and to use it in the restoration. We keep talking about dyes and not only in the chemical lab, other, other analytical work uh, um, could happen, but um, identification of dyes, it's very important, important in many, in many situations. And one very important, it uh, uh, relates to the um, uh, dating of the, of the materials or uh, uh, pertinence to various, to a particular culture. Uh, so we use high performance liquid chromatography instrument and not only we we started to do analytical work of dyes in the in our department in the department of textile conservation <clears throat> little by little we our work uh, i'm talking about progression from the 74 when when the department was formed one separated from the object actually because it existed as activities but it was all together with object, other objects. Um, so since then, we we grew our responsibilities in the museums and conservators was harder and harder to, to perform this analytical work also. So we hire a chemist, organic chemist, and um, uh, later the Department of Scientific Research um, was formed. And um, nevertheless, we work very closely together and conservators continue to be very, um, working very closely with the scientists uh, to, to, to identify uh, dyes, to decide analytical work on a specific object, to initiate or to follow up in, the, in a particular analytical work. So um, there are other methods uh, complementary to this method that scientists are, are using it. Uh, earlier, I was mentioning that uh, we do have a solvent lab and sometimes you need to use solvents um, to deal with a particular issue. We try, um, and again, in the, in the last uh, decades, um, the way we see the um, what's happening with an object, the condition of the of one object is changed a little bit. So I remember in the in the late eighties, even beginning of nineties, especially curators will ask us to have always a very clean object. Very, um, it was a time even before that when every single object will become will come in a museum. It would be washed. Not anymore. Uh, we learn to differentiate um, between the the condition issue that are part of the history of the object and not harmful to the object. They're just aesthetically maybe not the the best uh, visual, especially in the eye of um, an an initiated person, the public sometimes wants to have everything, to see everything perfect. And uh, um, five years old or, or uh, <clears throat> it's not the same with a uh, hundred years old object. Let me just get my voice a little better here. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
so we 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 live with this um acceptable uh, condition of the object if it's not harmful to the object if it is then we have to perform um uh, concept of specific conservation uh, work which could be uh, done with solvents and you have to make sure especially in the close environment and not only uh, it has to be we have to think about uh, people's health um, and uh, um, uh, then the object health as well we're talking about washing <clears throat> washing the object so as I said before, before washing an object, much more consideration is given um, to the, the necessity of washing it. Maybe you need to remove um, and you need to improve the condition of an object, but you have to consider what you gain and what you lose to it. So of course, having the facilities and being ready in every moment to you need to wash an object for emergency or for decision um, made in time and, and considering everything, um, you need that, those facilities, but uh, don't feel like that you have to use it every, every week. So uh, this is a big space for us uh, at the Met because um, we have a as I said, from a small fragment to a very large object. Uh, Matt has a large collection of carpets and large collection of tapestries, European tapestries, which are all considered uh, size. Now, it's hard in, in Manhattan and not only everywhere in the world space, it's an issue. So uh, it's very, very hard to keep one huge space only dedicated to activity that you're sporadically doing it. So uh, we came up with the idea of um, building uh, a pool every single time we need to wash an object and building a pool accordingly to the object size. So um, which could be dismantled after, uh, after washing it and putting away and use the space for other activities, treatments, exhibition preparation, even photography, although the museum has a photo studio where the photography could be done. But for the large object, this is perfect. So I'm just going briefly through um, few conservation, restoration uh, methodologies that we use at the Met and they're used worldwide, some of them. Um, there are others and uh, again, we can discuss about this or you can uh, think about your object, what your object would, would need. So we are having here um, the, Famous emperor carpet, I showed it before, you saw it in the main area of the lab. And um, this is a front and the back of the carpet before the restoration. It looks perfectly fine. It's all together. But when you go into details, the situation was different. Um, the, the back, uh, there are all these patches that support it. Uh, the carpet, but also distorted the carpet. And um, there are over, uh, if I well remember, 700 patches there. there uh, and if you're interested in more on the project, I'm sure you can find it on the Met YouTube. Uh, we made a video about the conservation of this piece. So uh, removing all those patches and relaxing the carpet and bringing it to the, to the original size and uh, supporting it and compensating for the losses. So uh, for that, uh, we have dyed all this fabric that match matches the original color. Um, and it was a challenge because it has to it has to match perfectly the color, especially this inner border of the yellow color. It's very narrow and. Um, some some areas were, uh, you know, were lacoon, so it shows. 
Um, but um, it was a teamwork. Um, it was consolidated to this uh, um, support fabric made of wool. And the carpet was uh, uh, prepared for being displayed flat on the platform in the gallery we'll see it later we build a platform specifically for uh, to accommodate various size of carpet because again we don't display the same piece continuously you have to rotate so uh, but in other words we didn't prepare the carpet for hanging because that would have been a different treatment and much more invasive so uh, this is another fragment of a uh, fragmentary carpet uh, um, from India. And uh, this is just to show you that uh, we learn to live with, um, with a support fabric that it's not necessarily uh, compensating the losses with the same design. Um, there is a method of restoring it and reweaving it, but it's very costly. And uh, if you do it directly related with the carpet and not as a support, it could be invasive. So um, this is one way to deal with the fragmentary pieces. Um, and if you find the, the appropriate color to balance with the original and not to disturb, I think it's a great method. It's a stitching, stitch method. So these are our uh, famous um, unicorn series tapestries that are displayed at the cloister, at the section uh, up, up uh, on the upper part of the city of the New York City. And um, uh, there is a great, great series um, unique in the world. We have another one in Cluny that is La Dama La Licorne. Uh, I'm sure you know, but this is the, um, our series, which is, uh, which is treasured. But the problem with our series is, and in fact, with this famous tapestries, uh, uh, Apocalypse Danger in France and uh, La Dama La Licorne, as I said, that our unicorn public wants to see them all the time and they come from all over the world to see them. So they are displayed um, for much too long and they rarely have a break. So they have to be prepared accordingly to support the stress um, and to create the proper environment, not to not to damage them. So I'm not going to go into uh, environment condition and light level and so on. I'm only talking here about conservation. Um, on the right, this image you have seen. Uh, I mean, some of you you have seen maybe if you visit. If you visited the Met uh, a while ago, 20 years ago, probably you have seen it this mounted this way. It was on a, a fabric that was uh, treated with acrylic and uh, uh, that's the way it was at the time uh, when the restoration was done. But um, in our, our uh, recent years, we thought we can do better. So um, for the fragment were after treatment and cleaning and so on. Uh, they are still fragmentary, but uh, still precious as they are. They were just mounted in, in this fabric, which was made uh, hand-woven, tapestry hand-woven, or, or um, uh, weft face, uh, plain weave. Let's put it that way, with the um, wool that we dyed in the lab and um, we dyed a few nuances. So you can see a little bit of, uh, of differences in color here, just to avoid the uh, creation of a flat fabric, to bring a little bit of life to the fabric. So, um, Again, after uh, after uh, consolidating stitch, consolid uh, attach it to the to this fabric, and of course it needs to have an extra support, and it needs to have protection because those pieces are hanging, are displayed vertically on the wall. But uh, it was a good uh, it was a good uh, project, and if you have a chance to have handmade. Uh, 
um, material that will be great, but you have to always relate to, to the original uh, situation. So um, stitch consolidation to a full support could be done, although rarely, to other type of materials. And here we have this very precious and and um, look fragile, but actually um, it's it's fragmentary. But in fibers, remaining fibers are in in good condition. Um, an early piece, as you can see, from Caucasian mountains, and uh, the decision was to reconstruct the garment because it's important from that period to have there are not many example of the full full garment and um, um, the material was strong enough to support this so um, it was mounted on the on the cotton um, and the uh, cotton fabric that we dyed with the synthetic dyes ourselves in the lab um, and it was uh, a success. It holds well the whole uh, the whole um, group of objects. Now, for the small fragments, um, I'm looking at uh, for the small fragments. There are other there are other way of um, uh, conserve them of having them ready for display, but also preserve them. There is a great method of preservation, uh, which I really recommend, is the mounting. Uh, mounting it has the advantage uh, of being ready for display, but being ready for storage also. And uh, closing it, not with a glass, but with a plexiglass, with acrylic, um, in, a, in an, creating an environment, a uh, stable environment. Um, so, so it's good for the object. Now, here we have a stitch mount. We have other methods. We have pre uh, pressure mount method, which we will talk a little bit later. But stitch mount, they are, they are various ways of, um, various methods of doing stitch mount. And again, I'm not going into this. Um, but but um, I have teach that actually in the past, and uh, uh, there was a great interest. And the the, the whole difference is, is how you create the mount. You transfer the mount. You do it directly on the mount. Um, uh, how is that done? How the stitches are done? And of course, it has to be related with the type of the object you have. This is a small object, obviously. Um, so you have this is the way you you the, your object will look for display, but for the storage we always you have an extra protection, uh, a black cover for the for eliminating the light and also a, a board that you will um, support it for for handling and for storage. So it's it's a very safe uh, way of uh, of having an object prepared. Um, we're talking about pressure mount. So pressure mount is a great method. Uh, pressuring so, or closing textiles in a pressure used to be done with glass and used to be done even in the end of the 19th century. And we have some of those examples. Unfortunately, the pressure between the glass is not ideal because glass is not breathing and what's happening into inside that pressure, um, you create a bound between the objects, a molecule and the glass and often you cannot separate it anymore and you have deep preservation and condition issue. But plexiglass we're using uh, now, um, it's a breathable material. You just have to, um, and again, the method has been uh, developed uh, in the modern method in our department and there are various methods. Um, it depends on the size of the object, depends on the, the shape of the object and so on depends on the materials or the cushion materials you use we started um i guess in the night 
80s or even early eight, uh, uh, even late 80s with uh, layers of materials but in the market now um the felted materials or or all kind of this soft material that could take over the uh, pressure and the um, volume of the all of sometimes most of it they are very flat on the object could be absorbed differently so here we have um, a, a, an example with a thick polyester batting um, and the edge support so two edge support is probably difficult to see it here so the idea is not to have the to have just enough pressure but not more than necessary so you your object would be safe so again there are uh, many decades that uh, we have used in the lab in the museum this type of uh, method and it proved to be uh, good and object to be safe on this kind of mount now the advantage of uh, making a little parenthesis here the advantages of working with the collection uh, like the Metropolitan or or any other museum that have their own collection is that you build the history and you can check your methodology and you can have the continuation of of preservation of caring for that object so it's an accumulation but I know that many people around the world work with a collection they are not there they are doing the preservation the restoration the object go back to the owner and then a few years later they are coming back to them because uh, 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 inappropriate um, uh, preservation of, of the object reweaving <clears throat> Reweaving could be done with uh, in in various occasions. Here is a tapestry, and um, of course, uh, the tapestry again it depends what kind of tapestry because uh, it, um, depends on what warp and weft concentration depends what it's made of depends on how much information you have uh, to reconstruct uh, what you have uh, what you miss in that piece there are many many issues uh, we can talk only about this method for hours and not covering everything uh, it could be done for for um, uh, you know, as far as I'm thinking, for your object, not I, um, made of cotton that are a little bit uh, um, less density than the piña, <laughs> uh, if I'm just comparing it out of my, but um, it's a costly method. You have to have a very highly qualified uh, people. Um, training, long period of training, you have to prepare your own materials, you have to do the mixture, mixing of the material. Um, so you have to you you have to be aware of all this. So we have this rose in the courtier garden, um, 15th century tapestry, very early before restoration, uh, with with the big issues. Uh, you have it before restoration, and you have noticed that this corner down here it haven't been restored or you haven't been rewoven simply because we didn't have information and we will not um we are not when we restore we're not uh, artists recreating anything we just leave it as it is it's a part of the history but where we have enough information of color of design that we can do it and um, just for um, you might be interested i don't know uh, on the working table again these two different type of working tables on the one on the right a little bit older and on the left we uh, was designed more recently um, you can design your own um, working table for for the large object or even for the small object it depends of on what you need what kind of treatment are you doing here what we had in mind when we designed this, we had to think uh, of our of the object dimensions. You have to think how to 
support it, how to roll it if you need to, to accommodate a, long, a larger object. And definitely you need to think about this space of where you're, you're working up and down, working motion will be um between the rolling uh, part and the and the supporting part and of course between this uh, open area uh you will support the object you will not just stress it you will support it with uh, cardboard or you can have other method of supporting the object that and will be in the construction. But again, uh, the working frame, the tension table, it's, it's really important. Uh, on the working, to mention is we never put a full tension. Tension is just local, um, where uh, applied to the area where we work. Having the full tension would be too much. So basically, as you see here, it's not tension at all. It's just a relax. So you need to uh, display those objects. So sometimes, as I was mentioned with Emperor Carpets, we went to the luxury of creating the whole platform so the carpet will stay flat. But when you have the tapestries that um, there is a, there is a um, design made to see in a vertical position, it's a, it's a story there. Uh, there are figures that has to stay vertically. There are many reasons for for displaying those pieces in a vertically on the wall. It has to be support. They have to be supported. Otherwise, um, um, you, you you will create damage. So this is uh, most of uh, the time our way of supporting. It could be full support also, but for the piece uh, for the tapestry in a good condition. We just uh, have a strap uh, that, uh, and then a dust um, cover and extra support on the top. You will have a lining on it. We we hang it with Velcro and webbing. Um, all all this it it it's not as just as simple. The the stitches, um, with the ease of the fabric um the lengths and so on everything uh, was tested everything it's done in a certain way and um there is a reason for every single time you put a needle in 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 an artwork so uh and every single time you can avoid that um it's better to do it so for the uh, pieces that are uh, fragile or pieces that are small and there's no reason to do a stitch mount, you just display them at a very low angle in a board uh, like this uh, fragment here. And um, the good thing is it will, it will be um, preserved like that in the mount, in the storage. So you will have it ready for the um for the display anytime but also it will be preserved of course we choose an appropriate fabric how do you prepare the board and that goes for the mounting that we discussed before too in a collection i think you need to think about consistency you think you have to think about the mat neutral materials from the conservation perspective from aesthetic perspective um they have to be material. You have to use material that they are tested, um, and uh, uh, also material that will be available to you. So you will not change it uh, too often because your collection, especially when you have a large collection in a big museum, you don't want to have a, a you know mixed mix uh, type of. Uh, uh, materials and different aesthetic and so on. We want to have consistency. So uh, just uh, just to summarize different type of uh, methods of displaying, especially not so large fragment uh, uh, object, we have um, the stitch mounts, um, we have the pressure mounts, right? 
and uh, uh, all both vertically displayed and we have the unmounted fragments. So unmounted, just sitting on a board, um, covered with appropriate materials and displayed at a very low angle. Now, just a little bit about handling a textile, especially the large object. Now, we know um, ideally is not to touch that object, never, to have a supporting material that you touch and not the object. In the case of a large carpets or, or tapestries or other object, other hanging, you have, you have no choice. You will have to have the uh, appropriate trained team work, you will have to have a space, um, you will have to have the people who will help you, the installer, uh, and again, uh, we are fortunate that Matt, to have all this uh, group of people with whom conservators work, um, but uh, if you don't have the luxury, you have to figure it out how, how the museum work or your institution work could be co coordinated. So this is just one uh, an example of installing tapestries um, in one of the uh, exhibition, tapestry exhibition at the Met. Um, here we have another example of installing carpets, another method of installing it um, in the um, Islamic galleries, al Khalsa galleries. And uh, of course, you have to consider what type of object it is. Tapestry is one type of weaving, carpets a different type of weaving. They both have a different type of support. Uh, so all this uh, consideration um, have to have to be taught. Now we are we were talking about the emperor carpet earlier and the support we gave it and the platform platform we display. So here it is in one of the uh, Alticalsa gallery after after renovations and um, after 2011. Um, so this platform could accommodate um, the emperor carpet, but not only because we we rotate uh, our pieces uh, quite often. And this depends what it is. We will not go into that uh, subject too deep now, but uh, larger pieces, uh, if you have two or three uh, even more, if you're lucky, uh, pieces to rotate, then you will, as more pieces you have, more time for resting you will give in the storage to your piece. So, and less handling, of course. So you have to consider all this uh, when, when preparing the gallery. Another way of um, of displaying. Now, this is a very fragile material. It's a very early material in the Egyptian galleries, and um, it's important. Was important for us to keep the pieces uh, folded just the way they were um, found in a burial. So. Um, to, in order to do that, we have to build support for each piece individually, and uh, we choose just one to be a little bit um, not fully open. They are very large, but just a, uh, one one further step uh, in letting the public understand the, the textile. Uh, another way of displaying. Um, a costume in a permanent mount, and this is again in Alticalsa galleries. Now, this this piece is really um, difficult to handle repeatedly. So we prefer it to have in a permanent mount supported, and this is the storage. Um, you could easily transport this in the gallery. You can protect it in the storage for light, and it does have a underneath a proper support to to eliminate stress for the piece. And once you have it in the gallery, you're just covering with appropriate material, the mount, uh, and you cover it with plexi and you're done. So it's a good method to um, preserve the piece and to display it as well. Now storage. Storage is a very important um, 
consideration and and the subject and a very complex one. So we all have our evolution into, I like to say evolution in, in storing our artifacts and the map has its own too. And we started in, uh, or, or in 82, not started, but in 82, we are like this, it's part of the collection because they were stored in the different departments, storage conditions were different. And uh, we just, uh, um, bring brought together all the various the, the textile in various department in a single storage rat textile center it's called right now and the uh, conservators were really working very hard in uh, um, taking the necessity of every single piece so fortunately i was also involved part of the team so i have the full history uh, in my memory and it was a great experience um, but uh, considering your collection, considering their needs and considering the format of storage and their various, that's another subject. Um, and I'm happy to respond to answer question if you have uh, more, but for sure we cannot cover the whole subject because it's very complex. Uh, but this is where we are today with the storage now. One way to store are these cabinets and individual pieces, those are sutra cover, um, which having have a board, uh, state board, and they're just, um, um, we created this storage format for them. We're lucky at the Met to have, I'm looking at times, excuse me, stop me when I'm talking too much. Um, we're we're uh, trying to have consistency in what we're doing because uh, <clears throat> and not to go too creative every single time uh, you come with a different idea over a collection that it's so active uh, you have to have consistency and you have to figure it out the best uh, variation of course of uh, storage format but but keep going with the same um, uh, type for a particular object. Uh, this is an exception, uh, storage mounted, created individually for a very fragmentary archeological pieces, which are coming from the site with uh, impurities, with all the elements that has to be contained in the storage. So um, this was an exception when you really create an individual storage at the different levels that will allow you to bring the object out on the tray without touching the object. We came from this, just object being in a box coming from the archaeological site and then and then you're coming going in a modern storage and have it have it close and preserve until further things will happen with it. Uh, study or cleaning or most likely it will stay like that because it preserved a lot of information beside the object itself. So an overview for the one of the rooms of the storage uh, at the map. And here we have those mounted pieces that I show you before with a blackout cover, black cover, and they're just ready in the shelves. Um, here we have the oversized um, storage cabinets uh, where object can be flat. Of course, you cannot have that many of those, so you have to choose for your best or the most in need objects. We have a rolled um, compact storage, which is very helpful. And here the carpets and tapestries could be stored and you will see even mounted pieces that will be in a permanent mount. Um, and it could be stored in the in different part of the, of the areas uh, in a vertical or flat. And um, this was, uh, let me go back to right. This was uh, what I have to share with you today. So uh, I'm happy to answer questions and uh, talk to you more about uh, if you if you wish
Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Florica Zaharia, for that wonderful talk. I learned so much. I hope our audience from the U.S., Japan, Australia, and Netherlands are also um, learning from our uh, conversation on, on this webinar. So uh, we have some questions. I have some questions I took note of. Uh, and I'm just wondering, uh, based on your research, um, are there, have you found some indigenous ways of textile uh, conservation and how are, are they adopted to, how are they adapted to this modern technology of uh, textile uh, conservation uh, as you have shown us so many equipments uh, that are used for textile preservation and conservation? Uh, let me make sure I understand your question. So um, I, I, it wasn't very clear to me. I'm sorry. Uh, we're talking about indigenous work. Indigenous right? ways of I'm sorry? conservation. Indigenous in or say, yeah, traditional ways or indigenous ways of conserving textiles from the past. Ah. If you have uh, done research on these areas in your country or in your experience as a textile conservator, conservator at the Met. So uh, if I let me make sure I understand that if 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 um, if we found um, traditional conservation way. preservation in situ done oh. by communities or yes. done by Ah, yeah. well, yes, of course. I mean, um, every single group of people, I think they care about their, their textiles and they, they, without necessarily thinking scientifically like we, the conservator, do, uh, they know their environment um, and they try to 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 adjust to it and they try to uh, preserve their their uh, what they have their textile heritage for example if you go in a in a temperate climate you no know, like my country is mm -hmm. you grow up as a child uh, with textiles that some of them are treasured like uh, traditional costumes or a uh, bed tower or they're always pieces that are part of your heritage and you keep them now you we were told that periodically at least once or twice a year you have to air them out because they are stored, of course, not in uh, mat storage or your storage. They are stored piled on top of each other. Uh, and even storage, they are um, special made cabinets. And I have seen that in other culture as well. They are uh, uses essences that um, uh, not attract insects. And they are used in a way that the wood is put in a such way that make a uh, slight air, air penetrate. Uh, it's a ventilation. They know that they need that. So besides that, they they know they have to air it out. They have to take it out. So you take them in the garden. You know that you don't have to put them in the side in the sun, um, open sun, because you lose the color. People knew that. Uh, but you have to air them. You don't leave them too long. Now, of course, in the museum environment, we don't do that anymore because uh, you have a temperature control, you have the environment control. But what you do, what do you do in a fluctuated <clears throat> humidity and temperature and with the four seasons? And what do you do in your country when you have a very high humidity and uh, you have to, even in the museum environment, you have to deal with it. In India and in, in so many other places that you see the museum environment, open environment, and try to have ventilation and to avoid mildew and so, so on. So the, the communities and the people in a particular area, they knew their environment very well. It started to be a little bit lost 
uh, uh, we start to losing that when people start to, uh, living in the in the city, starting to use different kind of materials, uh, commercial uh, fabrics, and co we don't care about our textile the way we care in the past. We change them much too often, but in the traditional way, people knew how to how to care for their textiles not always doing the right things and we like to think that as the conservators we we improve some methods but um we have also we still have to learn from from the local people and from the textiles in fact if you bring uh, uh let's say a silk piece that lived all for 200 years or uh, so in a in a humid environment and and adjusted to that uh, and then you're bringing it to ideal uh, 45 percent 50 percent humidity control you're damaging it in time so you have to be sensitive to that we're another example we're talking about best material we can use uh, so you're using uh, free acid materials um uh, for uh, storing uh, safflower, Cartamus tinctorum, for example, dyed object. Uh, well, guess what? You will damage it <laughs> because Cartamus tinctorum like the acidity. So, but people knew that. The conservator has to be aware of that. So, I don't know if that um, responded to your question or. Thank you so much. Getting nearby. Uh -huh. <laughs> right, okay. Yeah. Uh, yes, because you mentioned about learning. Where the where these materials came from and what are they made of from uh like the materials and then the technology of the production of the textiles are very uh, important points to consider. Now uh we are now opening the question to our friends who are here with us. Uh would like to get the uh, read the question from Margaret Gaze Mooney. Uh, she's asking, what are the sides of the water bath made out of? I think you have shown in one of your slides uh, a water bath for uh, washing oh, the for steps. cleaning for washing. For and what was what was the question? What what does what the, are size the size is? of the water bath made out well, of? Well, this this are ah, what are made of. Um, well. We're using um, concrete materials, or but you can be flexible. It use use uh, whatever your material have around. Uh, it has to be a heavy. It has to be a heavy um, uh, brick or something that stop your water. Um, well, we didn't go too much into that, but underneath the object. There were a screen, a raised screen, a stainless steel screen where your object will sit. You sit will not sit down on the bath. Mm -hmm. um, so you will have that plastic. You need something to support the plastic, the heavy duty plastic, um, which contain the water. So you have to hold to create the pool to hold the water. And you can use anything for that that you have around because it doesn't come in contact with your material it's just holding the pool um so all you need is the uh, is the uh, the material that holds the water and inside you have those um screens made of uh, you can adjust to your size but uh well roughly Rough, roughly, uh, let's say one meter by half a meter or half a meter square, and uh, you there is a screen through which the on which the object will sit, and they could they have a connection. They are connected to each other. You can connect and disconnect easily to each other, and they store them separately when you don't use them. But you can make a continuous surface accordingly to your objects. Um, so it's a very simple, it's a very simple procedure. Other museum has a bath made uh, of stainless steel and they control the draining of the water. You can do that, but you have to see, you have to know your collection. And if you have a collection more or less of the same size, a small object, you can have a stainless steel made pool and not to worry about. And even in that, you have to have a support. Your screen support is pretty good. Um, 
because that will help you control the work with your object. Uh, but otherwise, you're just, uh, I think it's good to be flexible. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Florica. We have another question from Margaret Gies uh, Mooney. Uh, she's asking how long is a newly painted exhibit room allowed to dry before textiles or tap tapestries are installed? Aha, <laughs> good question. Well, uh, first of all, uh, you have to choose what to paint with. Um, uh, so this is one consider, but nevertheless, as much in advance as possible, the better it is. But uh, at least you should have two weeks in advance. I will say just roughly, uh, but as much as you can, uh, don't don't install an object over a yesterday painted wall. Okay, all right. Thank you, Florica. There's a question from Zulfikar Isham from Indonesia, uh, and he is asking: Is there a difference between conserving, doing conservation for European textiles? and Indonesian textiles like ikat from Timor in Indonesia. So is there as a difference? As, yeah. Is there a difference far, between yeah. conservation of European textiles with mm -hmm. Indonesian textiles like ikat from Timor? Yeah. As far as I'm concerned, um, it should, it, it, there are many differences between European textiles, uh, conserving them, or uh, objects from the same culture. But that's why you have to know your object. And knowing your object and knowing the culture, knowing the level of preservation, all that is really knowing the technique uh, it was in which was made, you know, perpendicular work with to each other or not. There are rules that you have to, to, to respect. As far as I'm concerned, there are no differences. Textiles are textiles. There, there are many methods uh, or various methods used around the world um, in textile. There are various materials and you have to know all that those and you have to take in consideration. But once you are uh, uh, good conservators, um, a good conservator should, should be aware of all these um, elements that pertain to a particular culture. Now in this world, we, even in the Med, we used to have specialized people by various materials because it's hard for us to cover um, you know, so much, so many cultures, so many different, and of course there are differences between European textiles and Asian textiles and um, object made in the workshop and uh, object made in the rural areas and so on. You have to, you have to understand your object. That's the key. Uh, but when you have, and usually the conservators in the large museum, we are, we are specialized in a particular area or in your area, you, you have mostly your collection is from your country or from your area and you get familiar with it. Nevertheless, it's important, I will say, to know what's happened outside your collection. So you can have a comparison point of view. Of view. Uh, but um, once you know the general rules and you're sensitive to the physical aspect and the chemical aspect of your object, uh, then you should you should be fine. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Florica. Uh, in the Philippines, I observe that there are a lot of textiles in museums, uh, even in regional or local museums. Uh, we, you've seen the one at the National Museum uh, in your last visit. And then there are also other regional museums with a lot of textiles, but there are no conservators, um, proper conservators to really work on them. Uh, can you give practical advice on how we can uh, go about the, the conservation of our textiles? That's a difficult <laughs> question <laughs> to answer. Um, what basic, I, will... I mean, the basic ways, like if you don't have the 
Uh, of course, Met Museum is Met Museum. We have a complete um, equipments and proper um, conservators are the, the specialization in that area. But here, um, of course, uh, we have difficulties also in that kind of aspect of um, yeah. museum work. So could you give mm -hmm. us like basic practical ways of doing textile conservation for small oh, museums yeah. especially? I, I, I was afraid of that question. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it will come. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> That was, um, it was interesting, uh, our visit that uh, Patis and her team, Patis Tesoro and her team uh, supported us with last, organized for us uh, last January. And uh, we learned so much uh, and, and so little because the time was short and it, you never know enough about your culture and about your environment and your situations in the museums. Um, well, I mean, you 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 need to train to train conservator, and uh, uh, that it's a that it's a must. And you need to have your authority, which I saw you 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 have some good good uh, people who uh, are uh, keen in supporting your work. So this is great. Take advantage of that. Um, so that has to happen. But until then, until you have the proper Trained people, and and uh, uh, with a uh, up to date knowledge um, on on how to do preservation and conservation, I will say not forget to look at what happened uh, traditionally there, and try to learn from that too. Because people knew, as I was talking before. Uh, in my experience in Romania, you you know the best. Uh, people knew what material works in that environment. You have a humid, warm climate. Uh, mildew could grow. Uh, there are many issues. There is ventilation that people did probably out um, naturally. Um, but you have to get to the point when you adjust that um, traditional knowledge with the modern conservation. Uh, methodology and hurry up on that I will say but until then um, just try to keep your your object out of light just try to make sure you don't pile them in top of each other without airing them and without checking them um, don't don't control the control the insect situation those are immediate uh, immediate problems mildew insect uh, light uh, high humidity so all that all those are really dangerous elements for the for the collection and you really have to find the proper space as much as possible um to it, it's a whole it's a whole um training course on on that i will say and it's very hard to cover for me in in you know few words what to do but let's summarize look at what your ancestor did take what's good from there and hurry up and sending people or or figure it out how to train people and bring the authorities to support your um not only the training but support your creating a proper environment control the humidity and control the humidity uh, humidity the temperature the insects you know and then we go to other other elements pollution of course and yeah yeah, thank you Sorry. so much. It's a, Sorry. Short, it's a short answer to a big, big question. Yes, it's a big um, um, question, really. And of course, a lot of uh, resources that are needed to uh, do proper conservation in the country. Okay, yeah. my, my, uh, we have some more questions that we received. Uh, here, we took this down. And um, they are asking, what, what would you do if the text if some textiles can no longer be conserved, like dead textiles already in quotation, what do you do if textiles can no be cannot can no longer be conserved? 
in the as far as I am concerned, there is no such textile. Uh, mm. Every single remnant of a textile has its own value. It's only a consideration of the owner of all the conservators or whoever uh, mm. to decide what's the value of that, not the material value, of course, uh, that those are considered too, but I'm not talking about that uh, historical, cultural, and so on. Those values, and what, what, how important it is to, to, to deal with that textile, because even a, an inch, even a centimeters uh, big textile could bring you information could give you uh, lots of answer. So uh, as far as I'm concerned, nothing, nothing is without importance. Even a raggedy kitchen towel and you have an inch of it. So it's really up to curators and conservators and uh, whoever the owners of the collection and people who work with the collection, it's up to you to decide what's the destination of a particular textile, which is in not a pristine condition. Mm -hmm. And if you think it's the, the only danger for a textile is to be in, in danger of destruction by mildew, by insect, and you have to action immediately to eliminate those conditions. And then you, when you're left with something, a thread, a warp, or weft, or a little structure uh, could be very important, but it's up to up to the people who work with the collection to decide um, what is important. I don't, in my collection, I never discard, and I never think, okay, this is not good enough. But of course, there are protocols and each institution has its own protocol. Yes. And at some point you have to, to think about what's important for your collection, what lets go and how do you let go? Yes. It doesn't mean to discard yeah. <laughs> because there are way to, you know, and it's up to, to the institution staff who's in charge of that to build a collection and to straighten the collection. And if one piece doesn't fit within your purpose in the collection, then there is a way to distribute mm -hmm. or to sell or whatever, but mm -hmm. never, never discard. Okay, thank you so much, Florica. We have a question from Christine Mueller from Dresden Museum in Germany. Uh, okay. She's asking, which detergent do you use for washing textiles? Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. we all have our we all have our uh, preferences, I guess. In the in the mat we still uh, use Orvus, but um people use Saponaria, which is a plant that we cultivate in our garden. I cultivate it in my garden in Romania. We use uh, Indian uh, walnuts. We use all kind of. Uh, yeah, I think you have to look into your environment, where you are. I mean, it's one thing internationally in the conservator community. <clears throat> what works for us, and we seems to each of us, each group, a professional group, we have our own uh, preferences, and we have our. Uh, um, needs. I mean, you don't need to use a detergent. Mm. You can use DI water, or uh, it, it, it's it's really depends what you're washing and depends what you're trying to achieve. So, <clears throat> uh, of course, you have to once you use the detergent, you use you you have to deal with the residues and uh, make sure you eliminate that and whatever. There are many issues in washing textiles. Uh, but um, yeah, Orbus is what we use for now at the Met and um, uh, in Romania, uh, in Romania, many, many people use um, saponaria, extraction of saponaria. Fantastic. Thank you so much. I think we have a few minutes left before 12 noon. Uh, the last question that we got is uh, this one for uh, many decades that you are a conservator. What are the 
challenges that you encountered in uh, doing this kind of work in as museum? a conservator yes <clears throat> oh gosh i don't know what i am anymore because <laughs> i am a conservator <clears throat> um a restorer it's called in europe but now i'm a curator too and uh, even at the met i curated exhibitions from the conservation perspective of course from the technical aspects and now in romania i'm uh, uh, wearing many hats uh, besides being an owner and uh, curating exhibition co-curating and with colleagues around the world or by myself so anyway but as a conservator <clears throat> if i am thinking as a conservator from the american point of view that i touch a little bit in the beginning talking that we are we are our conservation conservators work include the restorer work include the researcher work uh, a little bit of scientific work so a curate curating uh, work also um so what are the challenges uh, things are better now and um I'm not fully aware of what's happening in Asia, for example, in terms of professional groups interrelation. <clears throat> but um, it's always this um, collaboration between the professional groups. So they are the conservators, restorer, there is the, the curators, curatorials group, and that's uh, the institution administration groups. So where are we in relation to each mm -hmm. other? Mm -hmm. um, I like to think that we are equally important and, uh, um, you know, we are not just keeping the needle in our hands and uh, we are in charge of so many more. Uh, institution like uh, Metropolitan it, it advance um, in, in improving those relations. I mean, conservators are part of, of decision-making, are part of acquisition committee, are part of many institutional uh, decision-making, which is normal to be that way because conservation is a very complex issue and, and we have a lot to bring at the table. But I know there are situations in the world uh, when conservators are just keeping or conservator called restorer um, and conservator being something else working with object in the storage and so on. So it depends where you are, but um, I think in my experience, things got much better from 30 years ago, 40 years ago. Um, and um, me, I like the... I like the complexity of work. I like to understand the object, everything, the part that is prior to treatment, mm -hmm. uh, prior to preservation, you have to understand the, the object. If you don't understand it, do wait, wait for somebody else to tell you, I don't think it works. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Florica. We have one last, last question from our audience. Uh, and she's asking, would it still be all right when exhibiting garments and textiles with obvious stains and tears, tears? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. It depends. True. It depends what you have. This is a big, big question, big important question. Um, <clears throat> we used to think even at the Metropolitan and other museum, including in my country and, and in other places, uh, curators wants to have <clears throat> the object in a perfect condition and super clean, not thinking of the effect of trying to bring that object to the day one, it, which it shouldn't be. You should not remove the the a historic patina. I always said I prefer to live with a stain than with a with a hole, with a hole, with an empty. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, because sorry, that stain can bring me more information than if I have nothing there. Now, not to be under, misunderstood, that doesn't mean I agree with displaying an object untreated if it needs treatment 
or 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 dirty or you know you have it has to be a limit and as a conservator and the curator you have to work together and you have to understand the condition of the object and what's uh, acceptable and what's not acceptable yes thank you i think all those stains uh tears and other markings on the textile should not be removed no that's part of the social biography of the text <clears throat> when they are exhibited all right. I think that's our last question. Um, we would like to thank Dr. Uh, Florica Zaharia for spending the morning with us, Romanian time. And uh, do you have some last words, uh, Florica, to our audience who are watching now from Germany, Philippines, Indonesia? Aye, aye, aye. People wake up early. Over. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, I have such a such a respect and uh, much love for your culture and your country and the people there are wonderful. Um, so I think uh, in the in the world we still have way to go in textile conservation, and uh, as much as we we stay together and look at the issues and try to understand our the individual needs for a particular heritage, the better we can do. Um, <clears throat> But for for the Philippines in particular, I will say my my advice is look at the environment and uh, uh, look at the materials you have in relation to the environment in terms of production, uh, preservation, and uh, and try to try to relate and to create the spaces and um, uh, especially storage. I will say exhibition too. Uh, but the storage and the handling and those aspects, it needs it needs uh, to be properly understand and um, yeah, uh, conservation conservation restoration protocols to to become stronger. <laughs> Good okay. luck with that. Thank you so thank much you for, thank you for having me. Thank you so much for your time and sharing your knowledge and uh, wisdom to all our audience here in our country and Thank the rest you. of the world. Thank you so Thank much. You. Have a good morning. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Okay. Thank you so much to our um, audience who are <laughs> with us today, this morning, uh, with Dr. Florica. Uh, please stay tuned for our next month's uh, webinar series on textiles. So we'll have uh, more um, scholars and cultural bearers, bearers talking about their own textiles. Thank you so much and have a good day. Bye, Thank Florida. You. Speak soon.